<laughs> different, different parking lot. Um, yeah, different yeah, parking lot. No longer my parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you guys film first? Um, uh, Mariposa. Yeah, in the, the, in the parking lot of the uh, of the Yosemite Climbing Museum. Speaking of how cold it probably is in Yosemite right now, yeah. uh, I once slept at Camp Four, like in the cabin cabin of my like pickup truck. Yeah, I was going there just to like try to film some stuff for my portfolio, and it only got down to like seventeen degrees. I was so cold. Yeah, seventeen and, you know, degrees is really cold. Okay, thank you for, <laughs> for validating that. <laughs> and then all my camera equipment I had all the, you know the it was all wet, <laughs> yeah. and then I. I was flying my drone in Yosemite. I know you're not supposed to. Right. And then I crashed into, uh, okay, crashed into the creek, waded in <laughs> in my jeans. So, you know, it was karma for all the illegal camping and stuff. But Oh, no, it's always good to have an epic. That's true. In the valley. Uh, it's, yeah. It brings epics out in the best of us, I think. And, and epics are where you kind of learn the most, right? I didn't learn that time because I did it again and I crashed again. <laughs> Here's the thing. We were at Tenaya Lake. I'm filming. Uh, I'm getting a shot over uh, the road there. My yeah. buddies are driving their car with a big crash pad on it. Yeah. I'm like, this would be an epic shot. I'm going to fly the drone over the car, out over the lake. Right. What are the odds that a ranger is going to come around the corner? <laughs> and so when you're looking at a drone, the drone, like, um, you're flying it left. You're facing it. You go left, it goes left. Yeah. Right, it goes right. And they were coming towards me. So the drone is coming towards me. So the controls are opposite. Right. And a ranger came around bend toward us <laughs> so i'm like i gotta get this drone out of here i'm gonna fly it out over the lake so i go hard right out of the lake it went hard left mm. into a tree mm. and of course the ranger saw it <laughs> and uh she was really cool and she was like you know typically i would give you a warning but since you crashed it it makes me feel like this is a matter of public safety so Ooh. i have to give you a ticket oh and I was bummed. And I was like, well, at least I got the shot. And she's like, I'll stop traffic. You can get the drone out of the tree. No. And she gave me a ticket. It was like 290 bucks. And, it, you know, it sucked. But it was flying a drone. That was it, you know. Yeah. And so she gave me the chance to, like, go to court and ask what they can do. And they're like, do 40 hours of community service and we'll wipe it away. Mm -hmm. So I did that. And I still have the shot. So, I mean, now I've learned my lesson. <laughs> Maybe. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I might know someone who want, wants to buy a little footage of Yosemite from the air. So anyway. I got tons of it. Yeah, but, uh, perfect. Hey, Dean. Hey. This is the first time I can say this, but welcome back <laughs> to Nick's VanCast. <laughs> Thanks for joining again. Thank you. How have you been? Good. Um, been kind of, I think, when, when, were you, where, when were you there? Was it July or August? It was mid-September. September. Okay. So like a little over two months ago. Yeah. So my living situation has changed and no longer at the museum. Uh, and I'm recently found a place like yesterday, really, uh, in Yosemite West. So I'm going to be doing a caretaking gig up there. Might or might not continue working with the museum, might or might not do a lot of things, <laughs> but, um, kind of feeling more like I want to do my own thing. Yeah. Whatever that might be. I haven't decided yet. Maybe another calendar, selling t-shirts, jackets, stuff by the side of the road. Yeah. Just... Like I said, you're an entrepreneur. You're always doing something. Well, yeah. You're staying busy and you're always creating something. Got to create. Which is awesome. Yeah. And, and I've been feeling really creative, but then I've been moving around a lot. You just got back from uh, Joshua Tree, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. What were you doing out there? I, was, I went down there um, to hang out with a friend and some other friends over Thanksgiving and maybe make some photos, but I didn't make any photographs. I really haven't made any photographs for a while. I've made some images but really in the last six months i haven't done anything really creative per se besides like like maybe i'll print photographs or i'll mount photographs or put them on the wall or take them off the wall or you know something like that uh but nothing really new a couple things with this friend of mine who i met in mid-july um but otherwise and a couple things from mariposa museum but otherwise kind of like now I have to, I was waiting for my, my housing situation to get figured out. Now it has been figured out. And now I'm back in the valley. So I'm, I'm guessing. You're back home. Yeah. That I'll be making some images soon. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Did you do any climbing out there in Joshua Tree? Um, just a little bit. Yeah. A little bit of bouldering. 
You know, but, I still have never been out there. Oh, really? I, I need to make, every time I'm gonna go, something happens and I don't make it. It's an amazing place. Very different than any, anywhere else. Why is that? Uh, just the Joshua trees themselves are really trippy, but the light, the fact that you are in a desert, uh, the rocks, the shape of the rocks, they're all kind of wind eroded and very soft. It's also where I did my first calendar. It's also where I, I kind of learned how to rope climb. Ooh, nice. It was Josh Street. The first place I actually went, actual rope climbing was there. First place I actually got high. First place I took acid. First place I took mushrooms. First place I took, you know, peyote. That sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. And then I branched out to Yosemite. And, but it was close to LA. My friends could get out there. I had some friends that had wealthier parents so they bought them cars and we we drove out to josh tree and so i i've had this um and i never lived there until maybe uh, 20 years ago like 1999 more than 20 years ago now like 22 years ago uh i moved out there when i was making the first calendar oh i didn't know that yeah and um i i moved into todd gordon's place legendary todd gordon house which was like a, uh, they would be, Todd Gordon was a school teacher, of, an amazing climber, climbed, he's done thousands of new routes out of Joshua Tree and, and climbs every weekend. Now he's retired, so he climbs every day. Um, he, it was his house. And then he would just, uh, there would be three, I think there was three bedrooms, two bedrooms to it. So there was my bedroom and then somebody else would have this other bedroom and Tucker Tech, a legend, would have sort of this, living room, TV room, he would sleep on the floor in there. And then Todd would just tell anyone that he would meet, go there, hang out there. And then he would go to his girlfriend's. So he was never there because his girlfriend didn't really like all these dirty climbers. So <laughs> we kind of ran this house like a frat house. And I mean, just everybody at one point or another was in, in at the Gordon Ranch. And uh, a little story was Todd was in Germany climbing on his summer break because he's a school teacher and he ran into some german climbers and they asked him where he was from and he goes i'm from joshua tree and this german goes oh no i was there this winter and i stay at the uh the gordon ranch with all these people bullwinkle and so many people and uh todd goes yeah that's my house i'm todd gordon and he goes what he goes yeah that's my house i'm that gordon ranch i'm todd gordon and he looks no i never see you there <laughs> <laughs> So that's was, my house. <laughs> that, that's, that's my house. Um, and then when he got married, he kind of closed that place down, which would have been 2002, 2001, I think, 2002. Um, but I made my first calendar out there. We had a lot, of, a lot of fun times out there. And then I sort of drifted back into this whole Yosemite orbit where I've been in the last 20 plus years before a break of five or 10 years and 15 years before that. So I have a lot of history with that place. And to have that house, it's nice. Yeah, great memories, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, memories of, the, I used to hang out with Dano and those guys at the house like 20 years ago, I haven't been there since, but just to have a place in Yosemite mm. National Park, now I'm like no longer an outcast. Yeah. I no longer have to use trickery deception to continue living there. Yeah. Right, and and after a certain amount of time, it gets to you. It's like you learn how to become invisible, but then you really are invisible. And mm -hmm. so, and my life has kind of changed because of a lot of different things and people coming into it, people leaving it, more people coming into it. So, um, it was weighing on me. Yeah, you know, it's not like I want to go legit. It's just like I just don't want to have to look over my shoulder. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. As an artist, I feel like there comes mind. a time. Uh, what? Which I don't mind. Yeah. As an artist, there comes a time when you do have to put something out because otherwise people, you know, lose track of what you're up to. I don't know. I, it, when I think about it, something like that, I think about social media. And for a long time, I wasn't on Instagram. But it's like as a filmmaker, that's how people are connecting. You got to use the tools that people are using. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, yeah, there are people that are going to make those careers happen for themselves. Whereas... You can make all the cool stuff you want, but no one's going to see it in a way. Yeah, there, well, there is that part. But, I, you know, actually, I've taken a break. I think the last time I posted something was in September, only because I found that, um, you know, I had this breakup that happened in, in June. And 
we had a lot of mutual friends and so on and so forth. And Instagram was just too much of a chance mm. of running into someone that I didn't want to run into in that moment. It can be good to get off of there sometimes. Yeah. yeah take a so break. That's what I've done. And then um, I was trying to write quite a bit, but I've actually written a little. <laughs> yeah. Only because things were really kind of unsettled in my life. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, where I'm at right now is like... Uh, looking really forward to getting up there, looking mm. really forward to hanging out in the valley with no people and finding someone to make photos of, which I'm sure I can do that. For sure. It's cool because in your situation, you've put in so much hard work throughout the years and you've done so much cool stuff that a lot of eyes have seen. So when you do decide to just do something that you're passionate about or you make a photograph that you really love and you put it out there, people know your name and they're going to see it. Right. So it's just about the time that you want to do it and that's and your exactly audience it. is waiting. Yeah, They're they there. are. Yeah. I, I, and I know that. Sorry, everyone. But, uh, <laughs> but. Well, that's good. You're aware of that. Yeah, I, I am aware of it. I'm aware of what I, I produce and kind of like hibernating a bit to, to try to see where things end up. And, and, and when I actually do start working a little bit here, um, definitely think I'm going to make a stone news calendar for 2023, I guess is what it's. So it'll be out next year sometime. Mm -hmm. Pretty certain I'm going to do that. Um, cause I really missed getting in the car, turning on the ignition, smoking a big fatty and driving. It's all that, the whole process. It's yeah, not just, just looking through the that, viewfinder and clicking. Not even. Yeah. It's the whole experience. The whole experience and the reason that you want to go there. It's like, you're not going there to make a photograph. You're going there to fall in love. Mm. Possibility that you're going to meet your soulmate on the very next time you make photographs. You're a poet. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, ever since we spoke last September, I've yeah. been thinking about like art and photos in such a different way. Yeah. Not just the physical thing that you see, but like the story behind it. Exactly. When I made your photograph next to your van, I was looking through the, the viewfinder of the point and shoot Yashka T3 Super. And yeah. I was like, I took an extra moment and I saw the sun coming through the trees and I felt it before I just said, I'm going to, I'm going to just click. Mm -hmm. Now I'm like, where am I? What was this? experience like having you on this like new podcast and i thought of all that and now when i go to look at that photograph it's going to mean more than just like a nice composition exactly or good lighting yeah and and that's the thing with you know, i see other photographers or read other photographers descriptions and they, they become a little bit more technical or less um emotional or personal but i i kind of feel that one of the reasons why is because it that's what was supposed to be happening in that moment. That's how they were approaching it. Mm. And um, I approach it in a very different way because the people I'm working with, but also when you're working with these stone nudes that you know you've made forever and you're not gonna make any money off of, but you're doing it out of love, what exactly does that mean? Oh, he loves what he does. Well, no, you know, yeah, actually, I get love from what I'm doing. Mm. I give love from what I'm doing. Uh, and I'm, I'm looking for love and that perfect moment of balance, yeah. right? And I'm in love with that person, whether they know it or not. I'm trying my damnedest yeah. to be there in that moment. And so the photograph, oh, yeah, I was in love or I was high. I can say I was high through almost all the photographs. <laughs> I was probably in love with all the you know, yeah. photographs. So that last thing that I just worked on with um, Alexandria, which was a book about our relationship, it lasted one year and then she left. But... I can truly say that every photograph I made there, I loved her. Mm. I was in love with her. And I can truly say about 99% of the photographs we made that she was in love with me, except there's a few of them that I'm sure she wasn't. But those were all made for love and 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 no other reason. Mm. We can make a little exhibition. I want to make a little film, get an exhibition, then make the book. Ooh. This is a catalog, so yeah. everything backwards. But that was an art project and it was about love. And I was like, so... Then your life becomes transformed. So I, I was I was looking at my horoscope for the months, you know. I was like, what the f is going on? And, and it's like, you should look at life. Sorry, to use a bad word, but you That's should look at uh, how love transforms you, right? So I go, okay. So what does transformation really mean? So I research that. And uh, I'm like, Oh, it's, it's, uh, once you're transformed into something else, you can't go back to what you were. Hmm. That's like the easiest. Cause you have life experiences that 
you learn things, you see things through a different yeah. lens. Then. But I'm like, well, yeah, but I, I already knew that because I went back to Yosemite after X amount of time, right? I go, well, I kind of knew that. I mean, like nothing's, it's, everything is the same, but nothing is at all the same. Nothing has changed, but everything's different. The people around you are different, right? Right. Well, the, that... it's the people that change, exactly. And, and they're your interaction with those people. Mm. And that's the only thing that's changed. But so I found with the transformation, I was like, well, does that mean I can't make another stone nudes calendar? Stone nudes calendar? So like, no, that means you can. What's transform is fundamentally how you will approach it. Mm. What exactly are you looking for? Because I was looking for one person, one muse for 20 plus years and I found her. Now she's gone. Well, why are you gonna do this? What are you looking for? So that's kind of where I am when I think, oh, I want to make this other calendar. But I'm like, well, why are, you, why are you doing this? What are you, what are you looking for now? Are you still looking for mm -hmm. that muse? Or are you going to be looking for love? Or are you done with that? You find the purpose. The purpose is going to be different. The, the product to the outside world, it's mm -hmm. going to have maybe the same title, but the purpose behind it and what you set out to do is is different and the journey will be different but so I you haven't so. found that purpose yet is what you're saying yeah i mean that was the reason why i stopped it mm. i you know stopped doing it didn't i can't say finish now because i'm considering it uh i was thinking with this one i have a friend katrina de costa and she's a really good photographer she has my my six by seven film camera and she's made a bunch of stone nudes i was going to take six of her things and six of my things and then the next calendar, if she comes up with 12, she can have the calendar. Um, mm -hmm. That was one idea. And I still might do that. And I kind of already have those six things, unfortunately. So I don't have to get in the car and start yeah. driving and going someplace and making some photos. Yeah, It's like keep dropping, dropping back to that whole thing. Like the purpose of me picking up this camera was to find this muse. I found this muse. Mm -hmm. She's and, no longer with me. Right. And now, and it's like, and now what? And then now what? But yeah. life is such a beautiful and dynamic thing. And it's like, you can find a new purpose and do the same thing that you love to do with just a different purpose behind it. I think that's a, a really good possibility or, or I can, and that was the other part. I go, oh, I don't want, I don't to make photos anymore. I'll, I'll write. Yeah. But writing requires a certain amount of discipline and a structure behind it to, to actually use that discipline. Mm-hmm. Whereas photography, making photos, I already have that structure really built, right? And I know what the discipline really is, getting in the car, turning on the ignition and driving. Yeah. Everything will work itself out once you get to the location and there's the girl. Yeah. Right. With writing, it was like, that's a whole different structure that I really need to do where you have to really discipline yourself. And I talked to all these writers. I'm like, so like, you know, when do you write? Well, I write in the morning. Oh, I don't start before 10 or, you know, have coffee, I listen to music or write, you know, have a, you know, a couple cigarettes. I go, well, what about, you know, can I smoke dope? And they're all like, no. I go, I can't smoke dope before I start writing? No. I have to smoke it afterwards. Well, why? Because then you won't write. And I was like, ah, that's kind of bold, you know? It, but they were actually right, mm. I think. So I got to really figure that part out because I like to get up in the morning, drink coffee and smoke dope. <laughs> <laughs> it's your part of your process. Yeah. And then I think about, you know, if I'm going to make a photograph, then yeah. I'm ready for it. Right. I'm no longer nervous. <laughs> well, what I love is that regardless of what the passion or the drive is behind yeah. the next project that you're going to do and all the amazing things that you've done and continue to do and will do, when you look at somebody else's art and when you look at another photographer's art, mm -hmm. you're, let's say you do a lot of photographs and you look at another photographer's work mm -hmm. if you did if you didn't know that photographer can you look at their photograph and say they were doing that out of true passion for what they were doing can you tell by looking at a photograph if someone was really into it or if they were just clicking yeah how um you know really honestly by the 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 whole image itself and the composition and the moment and how much attention they did or didn't pay to some details um, and whether it was, you know, you can see when somebody's going and finding a movement and going back and finding that movement over and over again, you can see that. And that sort of makes things a little bit less authentic or realistic, or you can not, but you're looking for the little imperfections in the photograph. That's what's gonna make up something that's um, kind of made out of passion.
Okay. Because it's the imperfections that make up perfection. Mm -hmm. Whereas something that's made as to sell or in a really commercial thing, all the imperfections are gone. Mm -hmm. They're they're weeded out because those are distractions Mm. in a sense. And there's professional photographers, they always, when they try to, if you go to school, which I did until they kicked me out, but um, the one thing they always mention is center of interest. Photograph has to have a center of interest. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as a student, you start taking that really interest and you actually do start putting the center of interest right in the center, right? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't learn the rule of thirds yet. Yeah, but I mean, and, you know, <laughs> you, you can, can still move tweak it, rules. But uh, even if you move it off the one side or the other, you really know what, what they're, you know, yeah. it, it comes across, this is what you're supposed to see. Right. Right. And this is what you're not supposed to see. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you will feel that, like when I say in the composition, you know, they're not going to use a heavily negative composition where there's all this stuff out there that's not doing anything to sell what's in the photograph, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the light's going to be really good. Mm. The pose is going to be just too good, like it was done a few times to get it right. Mm. Um, and then everything else, the styling and everything else to go with it. There's a photographer actually that I recently discovered who I was like, their process is so fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was Platon. Mm. You know who he is, right? Yeah, yeah. And he he was featured in a show on Netflix called Abstract. And Mm -hmm. he was talking about just ever so slightly changing the way that someone's head is positioned where you catch a little bit more light. And, Mm -hmm. And he was really connecting with the, the, the subject across from him right. and being able to just, it was almost like a painter, how they move their paintbrush right. is what he was doing. It was amazing. Actually, we have, I have a video I want to show you okay. related to this. Uh, and before we do that, I wanted to introduce somebody who's going to be pulling up videos today, James Connolly, over there in the driver's seat. What's up, James? Hello. How's it going? James Connolly. Uh, and I went to high school together, and he is the perfect person to be on this show today because he is more entrenched in the climbing world ah. than I am. So we're both big fans of yours, Dan. Uh, <laughs> James, tell us about yourself. Uh, yeah. Well, first of all, thanks for having me on. I'm happy to be a part of this conversation. And uh, like Nick said, I went to high school with him, and my dad was a big wall Yosemite climber. Oh, so. Nice. He introduced me to the wonderful sport of climbing at the the age of two, <laughs> and uh, I've been climbing ever since. Uh, worked uh, through climbing gyms and spent a lot of time in Yosemite myself. And well, you welcome up at the West. Yes, thank you. And you did a lot of stuff with the Yosemite facelift too, right? Uh, yeah, I did two years of volunteering up there and nice. bringing other volunteers up there as well. So had some awesome times. Uh, partaking in all the festivities up in Yosemite Facelift. Right on. Well, thanks for being here, James. Yeah. Um, there's a video. Uh, I was wondering if you could pull up the the last video of Plat- Platon. Platon? Yeah. How do you say it? Platon. Platon. Yeah. Uh, That's where we were going to do the picture. His neck was tense. His eyes were wide open. And Zuckerberg. he almost resisted every opportunity I made to connect with him. And then I said to him, you know, You've succeeded more than any other person I've ever met on the planet. But you must have failed along the way. And when you fail, how do you cope with failure? He looked at me and he said, there is no failure. I just love what I do. So I said, show me. And everything changed. It's extraordinary what a simple question can do that connects with his value system. So it's not always just tweaking somebody's face or neck or whatever. It's asking exactly. a question. It's connecting with your subject. Mm-hmm. I think that's amazing right. that he's able to do that. Exactly. Do you find that you do the same type of thing? Yeah, um, that's what I try to do. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I might put somebody in a position, but that's really just to break some some mm. stuff up. And then, honestly, I'll see when I'm making the foot, because I never keep a camera on a tripod. Mm. It's always off. So, and I'm always correcting and moving. Try to keep the camera down as much as I can and then bring the camera back up so you're not breaking any connection with the person, which is why people will put it on a tripod, then you can just look down and look up or whatever. But anyway, it's generally up in my in front of my face when I'm making the photograph. And I look at the rolls and I'll see almost immediately where I started with this photograph 
and it changed within one or two frames mm. real quickly. And I'm only making 10 exposures on a roll. So I'm through the roll rather quickly. And then there's downtime, you know, changing, putting more film in and so on and so forth. So I don't have assistants handing me stuff, so I'm doing it myself. So now you have a break and you remembered what you saw on the camera that was working and then you come back up and go immediately to that and it changes more, mm. you know? So it's like, I get really bored of like, you know, after a couple exposures and I know we can do something else a little different here and we can move the face a bit different and maybe it's getting better. And my portraits are, I mean, they're fundamentally the same, but it is different working with digital for sure. I've read some articles where people actually prefer uh, film today to, you know, take family pictures or, you know, of their kids growing up because it allows them, they've said they've, it allows them to be more in the moment. They're not focusing on taking a hundred pictures of right. the kid doing the same thing. They can be there and then put the camera aside and get it developed later. I think that's a cool concept. It is. It definitely is. And I have like four or five rolls of film that I got not that long ago. I actually had 10, but I gave someone five. I shouldn't have. But anyway, uh, and I was thinking about when I was in the Valley, I might meet a friend of mine who's going to, she's just going to be there for a couple of days and then she's leaving and we we're going to meet down by the river. And I was like, I didn't ask if I could make her photograph, but I, if I am going to ask when I get there and I, I have, uh, this old camera from the fifties, mm. it's a, it's, um, a single lens four by five and it opens up and there's this leather chimney and it's all made up of leather and wood and brass and steel and screws. And you have to do all these things to get it to actually work. Like you can't just, you know, or just hit the button and it works. It, you, you have to turn one knob for one part of the shutter and then you have to turn another knob and you have to push a lever. Then you have to do a thing at the front of the lens to hold the, the lens open. And then there's a spring that goes there and then you focus and then you push this and everything happens and and you do the process over again, right? Is that and, fun for you? Well, yeah. It's because, like a pain. <laughs> well, I look at it, there's two things I can look at as. One is if you've seen um, um, Tibetan prayer wheels. Uh, yeah, yeah. They have the flags and they'll spin the wheel mm -hmm. and they'll, you know, uh, say something and then they'll light something and they'll spin the wheel again and the flag. And I look at it like that. Right, you're like you, you, there's a ritual in front of your camera, and every time the person you're like, I got it, got it, and they're looking at you too, and they're like kind of entranced by the fact that you're actually doing a lot of stuff to make a photograph, mm. um, and you know, winding the film, and, um, yeah. So it's a real different timing. That's just from one photograph, click, yeah. again, click, so. You, you, the pace you're making a photograph at is is so different and mm. you better find what you're looking for really quickly in the in the viewfinder or, or have that in front of you really because you don't have a lot of time or film to really <laughs> yeah dial all that stuff in you're just doing ritual again and again you got to make sure it's all done right because you can actually fire the shutter without it being done right well not only do so. you prepare the the camera to to do you know you do all the stuff and then finally mm -hmm. make the photograph but then you also got to make sure all your settings are dialed too. Yeah, more or less. You got that shot yeah. and then you, if it's <laughs> messed up, you may know then or you may find out later. And I don't use a light meter with it. Okay. No. It makes it even more of a challenge then? Yeah, no, because I can figure it out. I mean, cl oh, I'm close. I'm close enough. Yeah. Right. But I go, oh, no, no this should well, work. <laughs> well, you're the master, obviously. But I mean, me having not done photography for any length of time at all and mm. primarily doing video, growing up doing video, it's like, you kind of, you start rolling and if you don't know that much about settings, you kind right. of, you roll and, and you can adjust shutter and ISO right. in the shot. Right. So it's like kind of cheating. You get, you start rolling, you'd be terrible exposure and you, you kind of get into that. And then with photography, you got to be like way more tuned into like, okay, what settings and you, yeah, with digital, you can take a bunch. Okay. Those look terrible. I'm going to lighten it up. I'm going to change the exposure or the shutter or whatever. But uh, with film, you definitely have to know right. what you're doing to more of an extent. Yeah, well, yeah, film is, a, but also with digital, people look at my stuff now and they're like, what are you doing? Yeah. What, what lens is that? I'm like, what, what are you doing? It shouldn't look like that. I mean, there's something going on here. What do you mean? I'm being like critical? No, just like, well, I do a lot of stitching. Mm. And, oh, yeah, and, yeah, that's right. You know, 
playing with perspective and putting a bunch of stuff together and compositing things that are, I, I do my composite, it's live kind of like they're there. Everything's shot or all the photographs are made on the location, but I'm, I'm doing all kinds of things and stuff. And um, <laughs> so uh, when you see it, you're just like, what? You can't, how do you get that field of view? What's going on here? Why well, should have distortion, but there is none. What's going on? Like, why is that look? What are you doing? I'm like, I'm, I'm playing, I'm yeah. messing with you. I'm doing it deliberately. Right. You're in control of yeah, all of that know stuff. Exactly what I'm doing. It's not yeah. an accident. Yeah, <laughs> no. yeah. I'm yeah. so stoked that we're talking about photography, and this is perfect because we have some of your photos. Uh, uh, that, yes. And now we have this screen, mm -hmm. which uh, we might be able to pull up. It was funny too because I was you were like text me some I'm like I'm texting you all these nude photos right and he's all like no I don't think that they're gonna allow nudity on Spotify I'm like oh I've run into this problem before but yeah I so, mean <laughs> they're, these are still great great photos you can find all of Dean's work uh, go find a stonenews.com <laughs> yeah. yeah you can find it there or wherever but that's that's is is funny that was hilarious yeah. and I'm at work and I'm getting these texts I'm like. Nobody walk into my office. Dean's texting me. <laughs> um, James, we have a couple photos. Could you pull up the, the first photo for us, please? Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful photo. I saw this on your Instagram actually recently, right? Yeah, in but black, and, black white. and white. That's the last photo I posted. So this is my friend Kristen. And uh, she showed up literally like her email showed up like a few days after someone left me uh alexandria left me um and it was kind of this journey for us to actually get together and, and eventually she showed up about a month or so afterwards and um she said oh yeah i really want to make some photographs with you you know I go, all right you know she goes yeah i want to do this thing i want to have like dried tears of blood and like my mouth you know i want to be taped with duct tape and it has to do with this thing that happened to me when i was a teenager and i'm like all right yeah i can't make this photograph and so we made the photograph and then I was playing with um, a process that I use to bring back detail into images. So like it's when people look at photographs, like you're looking at the, the highlight and the dark. And I do this thing that gives you all kinds of detail coming back. You actually lose detail when you make film and also when you make digital, you actually lose detail by, by your brightness key and, and a lot of other things. And I change things. So anyway, I was doing this process and um, I made a mistake in the process. Mm. And then that popped up and I was like, oh, and then I examined the mistake a little bit so I could continue making that thing happen. And yeah, I felt it really kind of worked, um, made it a much stronger photograph, really different than most of my stuff. You hear that? Yeah, that was kind of strange. Someone yeah. outside? I don't know. Someone knocking on the van, can you hold on a second? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, there's a cat on your hood. Oh. oh. <laughs> you think we could get the cat to come in here? I don't know. <laughs> ah. Oh, wow. Well. <laughs> I'm going to bring my shoes inside so nobody steals my shoes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that actually happened one time in Patagonia. Um, I was there with Kevin Thaw, Leo Holding, and a couple of other people. And we were leaving, we had left Patagonia, we were in this place, Chaltan, and we were gonna go to the airport, not Chaltan, we left Patagonia, we were in Calafate at a, at a, a hotel, and, and we were gonna get um, a bus to the airport, whatever, the next day. And there was these, we were in a pension, like a hostel, and uh, there was these drunk Americans, like students or something, or maybe they were Israelis, I can't remember what they were. But anyway, uh, Leo Holding, kind of had words with one of them. And then he woke up the next morning and they had put their tennis shoes outside the their room because they were stinky. All the shoes were gone. <laughs> Everybody's shoes were gone except for mine. I refused to put them outside. There you go. <laughs> I to keep them with me, yeah. Um, yeah, it was funny, anyway. I'm glad I kept my shoes. You almost got a cat on the van cast. Yeah, I almost got a cat, yeah. This is a beautiful photograph though. Thanks. So what I started doing with the stuff of Alex is I started cropping it really tight. Mm. I think you sent me one I of sent her, you, right? Can right. You go to the next one, James, actually. I think is, uh, is that her? Yeah, that's her. So that's not the tight crop, obviously. Okay. That photograph was actually 
the last photograph we made when she came to take her stuff mm. after she called and said, I'm gone. And it was uh, one year to the day that she showed up was when that photograph was made. And she's kind of almost ready to cry in that image or probably was crying quite a bit. Um, so she shows up in this emotional time and you go, let's make a photograph. How yeah, I did happen? actually. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> people might think that's kind of weird, but and, and I asked. I didn't just bring out. I don't just bring out a camera. And I mean, she was crying, and I go, you know, you're beautiful. I mean, she's leaving me, but I hadn't had time to change how I felt. And I still really haven't in a lot of ways. But I'm like, you're beautiful. You're so beautiful right now. I go, can I make your photograph? And she just, I mean, so I when made you some photographs, I didn't make that many, but right. I made some. So with something like this, are you thinking more of the emotion at the time? Are you looking at this and thinking like in terms of Platon, like move your chin this way. I'm going to get more light on your eyes this way. Yeah, no, I didn't ask her to do anything. Yeah. Not at all. And I really very rarely asked her to do much. I let her kind of get into a pose and I might tweak it a little bit. Because like I say, I knew all these photographs. I was in love with this person and I was trying to explore who she was and who we were together through our work together. Yeah. And this is the last thing. This is really before I started cropping tighter. Like I probably would have taken that photograph and cropped everything except for her eyes and her mouth and her, you know. Is that a and film? Just throw it in your face. No, that's actually digital. Okay. And it kind of looks like film. Yeah. Yeah. It's, which is kind of like nice saddling grain. a cow. Do you put it in grain after? No. I, uh, I run at a very high ISO mm, all the time. Really? Yeah. For black and white or color? For everything. Too? Uh, and the reason why is because my lens is almost always wide open. Oh, uh, okay. So I'm always running at a high ISO, highest shutter speed I can get, unless okay. I want shake. And, but in this case, I just ran it up. And uh, yeah, yeah, people are like, some people like rain, some people don't like rain. I, I don't care. If, if it serves me that I need to have rain in that moment, I'll run it up to 54,000 if I have to. Really? Sure. People aren't teaching that in college, that's for sure. I know. What can this camera, what's this camera capable of before you get grain? Um, the, the next photo, actually, I think, uh, James, can you pull up the next photo? Mm -hmm. um, I, with this, I feel like tons of grain. Oh, yeah. Amazing shot. Giant teddy bears. This isn't, this isn't the same. No, not the same person at all. Her, her name is Julie. So, and honestly, this photograph was made maybe two days before she passed away. When was this? It would have been 1988. It would have been April 4th. So this is a friend of yours? She was my lover. She passed away in our bed. Choked to death on her own vomit. And I was too high and out of it to understand or wake up. But that was kind of the end of New York for me. Yeah. That's heavy, man. Yeah. How, well, I mean, we were working on this book about her. Uh, and that was where the first time I tried that, that whole book and it didn't really work out <laughs> as it could have. So the image itself, you know, I made that with a this old camera from the 50s. It was a six by nine, really weird size negative, one and a two and a quarter by two and five eighths, whatever. Uh, and that's plus X film, no, tri X film. And it's pushed for sh four stops, mm. right? And even then, I couldn't get anything out of it until I actually scanning technology came around. Oh. And then I was able to pull that up. Wow. So it was a long time later. Yeah. What had happened was after she had passed, I uh, went back to my studio and took all the photographs and all the negatives and started cutting them up destroying them. The guy who was renting space in my studio showed up, stopped me, basically told me that I was done there, I had to leave. <clears throat> so that's pretty much what I did. In 2015, I came back to New York with, uh, I had done this book with Patagonia, Yosemite in the 50s, and they were gonna uh, put me on this book tour, but you know, the book came in at so over budget that they, they, they booked me two or three engagements. One was in Santa Monica with John Long and, and Jim Bridwell was great. The other was in San Francisco and, and Glenn Denny showed up who was my mentor. And that was great. And, and the third one was in New York. 
and I hadn't been back since I had left all those years. And going back and having a book, you know, that was, that was, it meant something to me, right? And so I'm at this Patagonia store and there's it, it, a lot of people showed up. And so I give this talk and at the end, you know, pe people are I'm signing their books because they're selling the books there. And this guy comes up there to me and didn't have a book, he had a box. And he goes, you remember me? And I was like, yeah, I know who you are. You're Christopher. And he goes, yeah, this, this is yours. And a little box opened the box and there was whatever I hadn't destroyed. Wow. Of the negative. Was it the landlord? No, it was my, my studio partner that he put everything into a box. Oh, that's Forgot crazy. about it because I 30 just, years later. Yeah, I didn't leave any, uh, you know, forwarding address and yeah. I went to Europe. Yeah. So you see this. And yeah. How'd you feel when you saw that photo? Yeah, when I saw the photo in the, the negative, I was like, you know, it's really hard to see on the negative because it was so thin and I kept on flicking it. And you get this thing, it's called um, incident edge in the light. Incident light glances off the film in such a way that it actually it makes it a positive for a moment. Mm. A negative will turn into a positive, especially if it's super thin, mm -hmm. like nothing on there. And so I was like, look, I, I, I'm never going to get anything out of this thing. I should just throw it away, right? And I turned it and flicked it for a moment. And I could see the whole photograph and I go, oh my God, that's so beautiful. And then it was gone, right? Yeah. And I'm flicking it back and forth and I was like, oh my God, you know, there's something here. Yeah. So I scanned it and I kept working on it and I got it up and, and I made some other photos of her and I, I looked and yeah, I, 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 it brings me back to that life, but it's really hard to get back to those feelings, mm. right? Because... I kind of ran away from those feelings for a very long time. Mm. And in the end, it's probably why I went back to making climbing photographs. And you know, I just was running away from that whole thing for a long time. And I went to Europe and I was running, you know, at that time I was running into trying to be a professional photographer, a fashion photographer. Mm, yeah. And you kind of have to hit the ground running, right? And so whatever just happened, you can't, can't be a part of your life right now, right? Because yeah. you, the beauty of America uh, is reinvention. Hmm. And you've done it. You've done it a lot. I think most Americans have, right? Yeah. It's like in Europe, if you're a waiter, you might be a waiter for life. Hmm. In the United States, well, if you're in Los Angeles and you're a waiter, you're an actor. But <laughs> um, but you are you can always be something else. And you can always go from California to New York and end up being something else on the other side. But it's the same money. It's the same language. It's the same people. So yeah. Um, reinvention and that's kind of what when I went to Europe and I was trying to do the whole uh, pro thing that I tried to reinvent right but I was still kind of making images like this and really personal images you know yeah and um, it's a lot yeah. of detail in a photo for something that you thought you wouldn't be able to get anything oh out yeah of the yeah negative. yeah and it was on a negative too and it it's lasted all, there. all that time too because that can fade after a while, yes right? it could and it probably did to some that's extent amazing then. and wow. uh, yeah well it, that took like a few years actually of scanning. Yeah. Let's put it that wow. way. Wow. Like a scanner has got a little bit better and I got better at scanning mm. and stuff. I would come back to it and keep scanning it and then make prints and prints and prints and come back and make prints and prints until I finally was kind of satisfied with technically what it looked like. And, but people look at that photo and they, they don't know what to think of it. I mean, it's it's a beautiful photo, and mm -hmm. and and the thing that's cool about that whole process of thirty years later seeing it again, scanning, scanning, scanning. If there were iPhones back then, and you had done this like on an iPhone, yeah, people yeah. click, click, click. They don't look at one hundredth of a photos that no. they've taken. They mean less to them. Exactly. They look back and they. I mean, do or don't yeah. it doesn't matter. This I, is I kept process. working on that photo because it it does mean something to me. That yeah. moment meant something to me. Mm -hmm. That person and to me that encapsulates her. Like she was kind of manic. They would call it bipolar now. Mm -hmm. And so she'd be really happy and then she'd be very sad for, you know, depressed. And that was probably in one of the, her depressed moments right after she was happy. Because I remember what was going on in, in those moments. So that was 88. So that was 88. And then... There's a photo. Ooh, gone. There's a but, photo yeah. that I want to get to after this, and I don't know what year it was. Okay. James, can we see the next photo? James, you're doing a great job, by the way. Yeah, James is like he's on it. Thank you. Actually, actually, James, you know? if you pull up the the next photo for us, please. 
Oh, yeah, I forgot about this one, actually. This is a photo of the Yosemite Climbing Museum. Yeah, I, I threw that one in there because that was kind of like, well, along with Alex, that was yeah. this this art project. And then I saw this photo, actually, in the LA Times. Yeah. yeah. Like a month ago. It was, it's <laughs> funny because the, the you know, writer, he interviewed me, but I don't think I was really in the story, but he interviewed me quite a bit because he was fascinated by stone nudes. So forget you, I'm going on the van cast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> he was fascinated by stone nudes and some other stuff. But anyway, he goes, um, could you... There was a picture of Lynn Hill they wanted as well of mine, the black and white. But they go, could you um, send over some photos, you know, of the of the place? And I go, yeah, I can do that. And they go, oh, yeah. Or do we have to send a photographer up? I go, no, no, don't don't worry about. It. I can't. I, <laughs> I go. Yeah. Do you know who I, I am? built it? I know what it. I, and so I, I, I sent them the photos that I took. And that was just one of them. That that was the. Uh, kind of the main room where you first walk into and what i like about that is that case uh it took me like one week per case wow to kind of lay them out and then and then make the risers get the granite for you know captions each case evolved and that was one of the last cases and what i wanted was so you can walk around the case and you had a sort of a three-dimensional like each facet showed you a different part mm -hmm. of what I was trying to illustrate there. It's very three-dimensional. Mm -hmm. And you, did you set it up in a way, I can't remember, like kind of going through, it's almost a chronological. Yes, it is. Timeline. Of I laid it out from, from the 30s until the 70s, which, That's cool. which is what I had room for. So this case right here, what, what time period is this? This would be the 50s. Okay. And uh, that's um, Jerry Galwis, who was on the first ascent of Half Dome with Royal Robbins and... Um, Mike Sherrick, and Jerry was a tool maker. So he made all the pitons in that case. Wow. Uh, and the anvil, he found uh, he found it when he was like 16 or 17 years old and hiked it out a couple, three miles back to his car and uh, learned how to make pitons. So a lot of those pins were used on the first ascent of Half Dome. That's so cool that like you are handling these pieces of history. I mean, Half Dome, they say it's yeah. one of the most photographed features yeah. in the world. And here you are with the rope, with all these pitons. It's really fun. From the first ascent of this. Yeah, I love super that. Super famous thing. And you're a climber too. Yeah, exactly. And I've done a lot of, what, three history books on climbing in Yosemite yeah. and a couple other books. James was telling me actually that uh, you did uh, some climbing with Lynn Hill on the nose. Oh yeah, uh, that's yeah. classic. James, what were, you, yeah. what were you telling me earlier? You were reading something, right? Uh, yeah, I was reading some stuff up before today and it seemed like... You went on a climb with Lynn Hill and one other up the nose before mm -hmm. she did her first free ascent up the nose? Uh, yeah, well, no, the, 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 it was the first time that uh, any of us had climbed El Cap, and that was uh, 72 or something like that. So it would have been about like 20 years before she actually went up and freed the nose. Oh, that's incredible. After that. So, yeah, but that was her first go on it. Yeah. So you guys were like in your 20s? or Yeah, we would yeah. have been in our early 20s. Yeah. Wow. And how did that ascent go oh that was wonderful yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah basically her and mari gingery hauled me up the nose and i thought that was fun and <laughs> I, I i read you got a little vertigo on the yeah, on the way up <laughs> at some point at some point actually i was leading something and i actually was free climbing and i unclipped myself oh god <laughs> from the piece and there was just between me and a ledge and i was like well you know i don't think i want to lead anymore you guys just lead <laughs> on i'll just follow and that's pretty much what I did. Got to the top, and I was like, "Yeah, this is fun." <laughs> that's amazing. How many days? Was it a five day? Push? No, it would have been three days. Wow. Yeah, impressive yeah. with three people. Yeah, I would have slept on the El Cap Tower. Then we would have slept on. I think we did sleep on Camp Four or Camp Five. Camp Five, excuse me, instead of Camp Six, and then the top. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Impressive. That would have been standard in the seventies if you're doing as much free climbing as you could. Yeah. And with Lynn, we did as much free climbing as we could. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> did you talk to her? There. Did you talk? I mean, first person to free yeah. nose. Yeah. Did you talk free to her cap. soon mm -hmm. afterward? Yeah. Yeah, free out cap. Yeah. yeah. When and, did you talk to her afterward? Oh, I probably talked to her, you know, within a few weeks of yeah. doing it. And What'd she say? Yeah, she was just, I was, I actually was saying more than she was, but I was psyched for her. Yeah. Very. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah, that's one of the benefits of having been around so long you end up knowing a lot of different people yeah so from lynn hill to potter to sharma to people in between yeah 
Can we see the next photo? Because there's some folks in the next photo that uh, I want you to tell us who these folks are. Yes, sir. Ah, uh, yes. I love this photo. Yeah. For people just listening, it's like the Beatles Abbey Road, exactly. Yosemite style. Exactly. El Cap in the background. This is, uh, so Matt Wilder is the, the front person on the left. And then you have Dean Potter, Evo Ninoff, and Ammon McNeely. Oh, I didn't know El that Cap was him. Pirate. Yeah, that's Ammon. Before he busted his leg. Before over. he lost his leg, yes. Oh my God, I saw that. You see that? Video today. <laughs> is, that, is that nuts? It yeah. was horrific. Yeah, I love Ammon. I, <laughs> actually, I tell Ammon, I go, you know, here's the thing, dude. It's like, I'm like, you are a T3 beta. They sent you back here to see what will destroy you. You're a Terminator, mother. <laughs> you're, you're a beta test model and your mission has been to destroy yourself see how many parts you can lose how many times you can hit your head until the CPU in you dies and it's not going to die Ammon right they're just going to take you back and then take you apart and look at all your f***ing circuits and go that was a hell of a f***ing job and the next time we got to make the leg joints a little bit stronger <laughs> right and he's like no and I'm like yes no, really. There's all, that's the only explanation for Ammon. Because he's still, he's still... He's still going at it? Yeah, he's still base jumping. He's still climbing. He's still a madman. We won't, we won't pull it up here, but I mean, for people who don't know, where was he? Ju he jumped off, pulled the chute, base uh, jumping, and, and the chute deployed. But yeah, what happened was... He, he came was, hard. Yeah, he was in Utah. <laughs> it's graphic. I think he was in Utah. I'm 90% sure he was in Utah. And he... You know, did the exit, and then he, when he tossed, what it's called is called the off heading. So what happens is you, your lines are a little bit twisted coming out, and so instead of going forward when the, the, the when the when your rig is completely deployed, you're actually you turn around and you're actually facing into the wall you just came out of. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty kind of a common thing, right? And normally what you do is get on the rear risers of the 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 rig and pull those things down as hard as you can and hope that all you have to do is kick off the wall. Well, I think with Ammon seeing as he, you know, may have had it off head and there could have been some twist in the lines. And the next thing you know, uh, the actual rig hits the rock. And as soon as a square rig hits the rock or any object, you lose the lift. And so then he lost the lift and he ended up basically compound fracturing his leg and sitting on a ledge waiting for um, a rescue. And, he, and I don't think that's when he even lost it, right? No, yeah. No, but they fixed that. Yeah. And then he did it to the other leg. Seriously. And then that's the one he lost, right? And it was like, and it was once once again from base jumping. So he just, he just, he goes hard on stuff, right? He must've been horrible with toys, <laughs> right? And gears. I remember, I, don't know. <laughs> I remember watching that video for the first time. I had read it maybe in a forum or something. And uh, I was like, I got to see this video. It's like, are you 18 years <laughs> old, old to see this video? And <laughs> oh, it's brutal. People, oh, yeah. I'm not going to pull it up here, but, but uh, he's sitting there. Mom, sorry. I think I lost my leg on this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, that's the thing with Ammon. He's very, you know, unless he's drunk. Right. But normally he's, he's very even. It's like, oh yeah, no, I really kind of f this one up. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, I think I lost my leg on this one, you know, but, uh, okay. I'm waiting here for a rescue and wow. oh, it doesn't look good. And he's in yeah. shock. He has to be in shock. Yeah. Yeah. He's in, <laughs> but, but also this guy is stronger than anything. Right. Mm -hmm. One time I'm, I'm riding in my bicycle in Yosemite. I'm going down to El Cap Meadow and I'm on the road. It's a two lane, one way road. Right. So both lanes are going one way. I'm in the left lane because I don't like being in the right lane because the tourists will run you over. So I'm in the left lane. And this guy comes up behind me in a pickup truck and he's like honking to get around, you know? And I'm like, it's right lane. He can't, can't just go around or whatever. So I like just absentmindedly flipped him off. I didn't even look, you know? I'm just like, blah, blah. Next thing you know, the guy's right next to him. He's like, what mother kind of look in there. And there's these two big rednecks. They're going to beat the hell out of me. I'm like, Jesus. So I'm cranking on my bike. I'm really close to El Cap Bridge, right? So I come around the elbow and they're right behind me. And I can see Ammon and his brother, Gabe McNeely. And I go, Ammon, Gabe, help. And they're like, you see them drop their gear and they're like, what? And they come running toward me. I go, these guys. And the guys came up and they, they're, they're at the 
the elbow, you can either turn right, left where I'm going, or right and get the hell out of there. And you see Ammon running up toward them, and they just peeled off to the right. <laughs> Scared them off for you? Oh, yeah. Here's They're like, the ah, ah, you want to hit someone? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> it was like one of those. Uh, they'd been drinking all day. They were looking for trouble, right? And I was uh, like, ah, trouble finds trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm instigating this stuff. But uh, was that, that around photograph, this time? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was pretty much around that time. And so, um, so the whole way this photograph came about, Charles Cole, the founder of Five Ten, right? He, he he gives me this call. He's like, and I have his camera. So years right when I started Stone News, I go, "Hey Charles, can I have two thousand dollars and and your camera?" And he goes, "What? What for?" I go, "I want to make this calendar of naked girls climbing." He goes, "Yeah, all right. You need anything else?" And he gives me. He goes really nice six by seven Pentax camera. I've had it for years. And every once in a while he'd call me up and say, Hey man, bring me the camera back. And I travel down to Redlands, give him his camera. And he goes, I don't want the camera. I just wanted to take it to lunch. You know, we'd have lunch and talk anyway. So he calls me and I go, Oh, you want your camera back? He goes, no, no, I want to make this photograph. And I go, Oh, okay. He goes, I'm going to send it to you. You know, I'll text it to you right now. The, the, the concept. I go, okay. And it comes up on my phone. I go, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I go, oh, yeah. Yeah, classic here. <laughs> yeah, go, we, we got something going on there. I go, yeah, all right, get your over here. And I go, well, uh, but what about the sidewalk? I don't think there's any sidewalk down there, dude. And he goes, I, I got that. I got that. I go, all right, all right. So he shows up, I don't know, a few days later, and we're all in the calf, all of us. And and Charles comes walking in the calf, and he's like, yeah, 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 yeah let's, let's make this photo. I go, okay. So we go out to the parking lot, all of us, and and Charles had a Humvee. Right. This is like 2002 or something. He's got this Humvee. And he goes, all right, everybody get in. And nobody wanted to get into the Humvee. Right. Dean's like, I'm not getting into that car. It uses gas, blah, blah, blah. I'm going, oh, cars use gas. And he goes, you, I'm not getting into the car. Right. And Ammon's going, oh, uh, I'm going to ride my bike down with Evo. And Evo's like, yeah, we're riding our bikes down, dude. And Dean's all like, oh, I'm going to ride a bike down too. And Matt, like, he was already gone. So Charles was looking at me. I go, all right. I go, you know, Charles, don't, don't worry about these guys. They're Nihilist, they don't like anything, right? Uh, anyway, yeah, I get in the cars. <laughs> we drove down there, and um, and I was looking at the GPS, this is the early GPS in his car in the Humvee, and I was like, according to this, we're lost. And he goes, yes, we are. So we got down there, and he had these, these the sidewalk is actually Formica. Uh, he got this Formica paneling for showers and then cut it. Oh. And so we, we find the location, which is really the only place where there was light going on, and I put these things across the road and uh we're making these photos and none of them can walk none of them can walk this is like the best climbers in the world at the time <laughs> none of them can walk like like tripping on them they're looking weird i'm like god oh, christ i go all right everybody stop and i got every position right and i go okay now you put your hand like this and everybody take one step forward or you know and then click and uh i almost had it now i go the rangers are coming in. there's a ranger car comes down the road we all run off to the side and uh and right before he gets there, we pick up the sidewalk, right? And he stops and he's like, rolls his eyes and just jets off down the road. He's like, I got more important things to do right now. <laughs> <laughs> so we put the, the sidewalk back and, and finally got that photo. It's just one of my favorite photos. It is one of my favorite photos of any that anybody's ever made. It's amazing. Yeah, it's wonderful. And, and it was just it. like hurting cats. Right? <laughs> Dean's like... <laughs> What do you want me to do? God, yeah, yeah. Dean was the only one who's into it, right? And I got the photo on my flip phone, right? And I said, "See," and they're like, "See what?" You know, I'm like, "Whatever." And now they then they knew, right? Yeah, exactly. That's so sick. Yep. Oh, and El Cap is so stunning. Yeah, back. isn't it? Like, if it would, if, if El Cap wasn't in the back of that, it's still a great photo. But that just makes it like, yep, from ten out of the ten to like. 20 out of 10. Yeah, exactly. And I was just trying to line up on a vanishing point with the photo. So I put the line, you know, with the line in the middle. Yeah. This 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 will work. And uh, yeah, it was an ad. They ran it a few times. I mean, 510, you know, they were one of the people. Backer was one of the people um, at Boreal. You know, they were just like, oh, you know, it's just like, well, what kind of photos do you want to make for us? Because everybody's making climbing photos of climbing shoes. It made sense. Like, oh, I don't want to make climbing photos mm -hmm. climbing shoes. We make other photos. Yeah. And so I did a bunch of other stuff for them that was different and met, a, you know, some neat people and did, just started to experiment. And that was when I realized that what made me different than everyone else was that I was different than everyone else. And so just go with that. Yeah. Right. It's like, oh, you're, you're weird. Yeah. 
Enough people tell you that, right? <laughs> you start to believe them. <laughs> Why do you stare so much? I'm a photographer. Oh. <laughs> All right. I go, I'm high. I'm not looking at you. I'm looking through you. <laughs> Nothing to me. <laughs> Guess what, everybody? We have to take a quick, quick break. We are changing batteries because that's what happens when you do a podcast in a van. <laughs> So Nick, you were telling us a story. Well, welcome back, everybody. Uh, no, yeah, during the uh, during our battery break, battery rest stop break, um, wouldn't that be sweet if the van was driving while we were recording? Uh, that would be kind of Things cool. would probably slide around. That'd be cool, though. <laughs> but I was saying, uh, no, James and I grew up down the street from each other. Uh, and James, you were having a birthday party one day. I don't know how old we were. But um, anyway, I'd ridden my bike to James's house, and my dad was like, oh, I'm going to ride my bike. So um, at the end of the party, I'll, I'll come and ride home with you. And so we ride. We're getting close to home. We're probably like a quarter mile from the house on this flat paved road. Um, and I was like, Dad, last straightaway. We're going to race. We're going to race home. And it's like dark. It's <clears throat> really dark. Nearly, and it's not pitch black, but it's very dark. I don't know what I was doing, but, you know, you're sprinting on your bike and your, your handlebars are going side to side. Yeah. And... Uh, I clipped his bike. Oh. <laughs> oh. I clipped him hard. Not going to be good. <laughs> and his his handlebars went side. <laughs> he went down so hard. <laughs> I was so horrified. I was like, I just killed my dad. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. And uh, no, he he was hurting. <laughs> but, he, you know, he, he was a okay, he's a tough guy. But uh, <laughs> I could not forgive myself for the longest time and he was limping for days we didn't have he uh he was using like um oh God. he was using a golf club like a putter with a oh, sock yeah. on the end of it for a cane no way <laughs> and every morning when i wake up when he was using that cane it was just a reminder of how stupid i was yeah. hoping he doesn't whack you with it <laughs> yeah exactly sorry but Dad. then you learned how to take out the competition on your bike so. <laughs> robin's racing <laughs> sorry dad um but yeah so anyway, back to, uh, yeah, this photograph. Dude, I just can't get over it. Words can't describe this photograph. Everybody needs to turn on their video and look at this <laughs> photograph. I mean, we we talked about, you know, like people like Dean in, in the last episode that you were on. Yeah. When you look back at a photo like this, I think even Alex Honnold said this in some video. He was like, if you look back at these photos, it was like the Lost Boys of Peter Pan. <laughs> these are probably amazing memories for you. Yeah. The monkeys was uh, the great thing about the monkeys. So you you know I uh, was a stone master. This is the seventies, right? Remembering means that everything is done, mm. right? So I can remember the stone masters and a lot of people from that year do, and they thought it was fun. But when you were doing it, when I was there, when I was living it, I was so young. It was just life, right? Yeah, it, it, it didn't have any more important than anything else. I made these photos, my friends. But with the monkeys, now I'm 40 something, mm -hmm. right? And now they, uh, now I know something is special about these people, right? And about this life. And so I'm making my photos, but, but now I'm really enjoying things in a much different way than I did the first time around. And so when I made that kind of photo, uh, I jump at the opportunity to make those kind of photographs. Even, I mean, you make, uh, Charles was cheap. He gave me 500 bucks for the photo, but that's not the point. The point was you had an opportunity to make an iconic image and work with your friends. Mm -hmm. And the first time around, it was simply just making these photographs with your friends. The second time around, you had, I had more of an idea because people had loved the Stone Master stuff in retrospect, right? When when I first brought that stuff out, when I was first making it, no, none of the magazines would publish any Stone Master things, you know? And uh, and so even with some of the monkeys, I have tons of people drinking and smoking and stuff like that. They, they still probably won't publish a lot of that stuff. But when I was making that stuff and when I was living that whole thing, you know, it was the same thing. You couldn't have a lot of money. You were living really close to the ground. You were illegally camping. You were whatever. It was the same feeling with as the Stone Masters, but there was hindsight. And I go, these photographs, they could be a little bit more important in a way, right? Yeah. But at least you know that they are, they have the possibility of being important. Yeah. Right? Um, 
And, and so, you know, and it was all fun and games and people started dying. That's just how it, it is. And, and then it's still fun and games for a while after people, but then, you know, a lot of people died and then it was just, everyone was gone. Do you ever look like as you go throughout life, like, do you learn to be more in the moment? Do you learn to say, okay, I've experienced these amazing times and now I look back and people have passed away or, you know, life changes. Does enough time pass in your life where you can say, okay, I'm doing this thing right now. I'm in, uh, I'm on Nick's van cast and like, you're going to enjoy that uh, more than maybe you would have like at a younger age because you're thinking, I don't want to look back and say, that was fun. Right. I want to have fun and know I'm having fun in the moment. No, I enjoy everything now. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. And that comes with life experience, you think? Um, no, it comes with life. So what happens with life is a, you you start off as one thing and you kind of end up as another, right? And that could be anything from a career that isn't working for you to a, a relationship, and, you know, a relationship with kids to you know a lot of things. And so you start to look back at a point when you had no worries, no responsibility, no cares. And, and you know, the word nostalgia means longing for home, right? So you're just looking back at this stuff and you, you become nostalgic and, you, uh, and you're looking at it through your memories, which are not, memories and feelings are not fact. They're something else altogether. They're an interpretation and expression of a moment. Uh, and so a lot of people go, that was the best time of my life, you know? I'm still running from the, the rangers and I'm still making photographs that you can't show in polite company. There is no retirement. There's no money for retirement. You know, it's like, uh, so I, I'm kind of like, I'm still living and I'm not looking back and I'm not saying, you know, the stone masters was the best day of my life because I had some of the best days of my life in the stone monkeys, but I also had some of the best days of my life with Alice, Alexandria you can continue to make your life oh hell amazing. yeah yeah and now i got han's place and i can have guests and so we can rock and i've just been yeah. sending texts to everyone going han's place come up you know but just because some will and some won't but it's like yeah uh, like i want to continue living this life yes. as now and yeah i have all these photos and i've done all this writing about all this crap 20 years ago and all this 40 years ago whatever you want to say and, and yeah, man, but this thing is like, like I say, I, I'm still living and, and I still want to hit it and I still want to smoke my dope and run from the Rangers. And I still want to make these photographs. That's just what I want to do. And I, I have to create to eat. And so I don't want that, that retirement plan because then I'm, I'm not doing anything. And it's like, yeah. And I keep wanting, I'm in like getting thinner and climbing harder whatever, you know? Yeah. Um, so that's, that's what I, I do. I think a lot of people don't because they don't have the opportunity. It's like you say, you can go back, but everything has changed, mm -hmm. but it's kind of the same, but it's changed. And, and, uh, don't get sad about it. No. Get motivated to continue to have fun. Right. Because the alternative is just to let your life pass you by and reminisce. Yeah, and reminisce, then, but have fun. And so that's why when I look at the photos and stuff like that, I kind of, in some ways, sort of, when I actually look at them and, and interior think about them, I do detach from them. And when I actually start writing about them, I reattach to them. I, I found yeah. so when I actually go back to the moment, then I go, oh, you know, that's what makes that photo special for me. Now I remember. Well, we are going to look back. Through the through the timeline once more, <laughs> we have a we have a photo that I was very excited to talk oh, yes. about with you because oh, yeah. we are not in Mariposa today. No, we are in Santa Cruz, California. We are in Santa Cruz. I think this is probably the first photograph that I saw of yours. My favorite restaurant is right there, Dharma's. Oh yeah, I don't I think I've eaten there. Get a lot for a little. Yeah, it's really good. Mm, what kind of food is it? It is uh, vegetarian, macrobiotic, and mm. yeah. Are you vegetarian? Uh, no. But vegetarian I, food can be great. 80% 80, 80 of what I eat will be vegetarian or more. Yeah. And usually when I'm eating in a restaurant, I almost always will get vegetarian. Okay. Can't fuck it up. Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this photo, though, was yeah. probably the first photo that I saw of yours. Oh, yeah. There's uh, a lot of backstory to this photo. So I want to. Um, yeah. James, can we see this next photograph? Maestro. 
Ah, yes. Who are we looking at on the beach here? So that's Chris Sharma. And so this is actually the full frame of the image. A lot of times it's cropped and, and, and both Chris and I really don't like it cropped. So, so the way this photograph came about was I met Chris uh, in um, France, say use or some other place. Uh, I was uh, following Lynn Hill around making photographs of her for something for the North Face, and uh, which they didn't like because they didn't like the photos. But anyway, so I was following her around Europe, and we were hanging out, and we ran into Chris, and and uh, and we got along really well, right? And and the reason why, well, is um, you know, most photographers are making a business out of that they have to be somewhat business oriented, and they keep pushing you and stuff like that. Whereas I wasn't pushing; I didn't care. Make a photograph, not make a photograph. It's just I'm happy, just happy to smoke dope and hang out or watch someone climb as to make a camera in front of my face and make it what anyway, well, with Chris, it was different. We made photos, we hung out, we, and, and, and he was young. He was 16 when I first met him. So I was up in Santa Cruz, he's up in Santa Cruz and, uh, probably about six months before this photograph was made. Uh, he had a girlfriend, like one of his first girlfriends and he's, he goes, he, I, can you give me a ride to Yosemite? Want to go climbing or whatever? I go, yeah, yeah, let's go. So jumped in my car and we drove to Yosemite and we went to camp four and he's bouldering in his tennis shoes and just cranking it off. Right. And he goes up to this thing called the Titanic, which is like whatever V1 or V5 or whatever it's called V8, V7. I don't know what it's V6. Um, and you know, it's, that's easy for him. And he's got these tennis shoes on and he goes to the top and he sort of throws at the top trying to be all cool. And he hits the top, but he's rotating as he hits the top and he comes off the top. And he turns and sees his landing and goes for his landing, but he's rotating all the way down. So when his f leg, when his feet hit the ground, he twists on his knee and I heard it pop. I heard this rip and he immediately goes down to the ground. He's holding his knees like, I'm like, oh my God, he's 17, right? And he had just signed this big contract with Fila, which eventually would go nowhere, but he, he had a lot of money. And he had all that potential you knew about. And all knew. that potential. Yeah. And everybody, this was him, Chris Sharma. This was the guy, you know, the great American hope or whatever you want to call him. And, and um, so then he's, there he is holding his knee. And from what I knew about ACLs, and I almost immediately thought that's what it was because the way he was twisting is I go, oh, you know, I don't know if you can come back from that or not. Well, obviously you can. But so uh, so he's, he's on the ground. I'm going to what are we, he goes, I go, all right, we got to get, get you up to the clinic, you know? And SAR, search and rescue is right. Their, their campsite is literally 50 yards away if that. I go, you want me to go over and get a SAR? He goes, no, please don't do that. I go, all right, what do you want? He goes, can you carry me? I go, yeah, get on my back. You get on my back. I carry him to the car, get him to the clinic. And, uh, and they look, you know, they don't know what going on they give him some ibuprofen and tell him to ice it and so he goes back to santa cruz and the surgeon is all like yeah yeah you're screwed you have you know acl and meniscus is kind of screwed up we can fix you and you'll be fine and so uh yeah sure enough they fixed him and um i stayed up in santa cruz and what i would do is show up at his house and and uh take him to the to the beach uh, carry him on my back put him in the car get him out carry him there and he would give me his pain meds because he didn't want to take those. And his, his mother was helping him um, heal. And he healed up. And um, this was like probably late spring, and he was going to go to a trade show in Germany, and he's going to be over in Europe for a while. He's feeling pretty good. And that day, we were just sort of bouldering barefoot, and he, and he looked at me. He goes, you know, I don't really know about my knee. You know, I, he goes, I go, you haven't gone for it yet on there, huh? He goes, no, you know, just, he goes, I know it's healed. Right, I don't feel anything. Huh? Whatever. Let's get out of here. And he's like, "Yeah, yeah. Let me try this one thing." So he goes into this cave here, right? And it's a really easy problem if you use all the holds. But I could see really quickly that he was rocking back and forth on the first bottom holds, right? I go, "Oh, he's gonna th and throw a dyno." So I get in there, put the wide angle lens on with my big six by seven. And I go, "This is so beautiful," you know. And and he's like going back and forth, and all of a sudden the waves come in and crashes, right? And I had my shoes off, right? But it, it hits my cuffs and my pants. I could feel the sand going out of my toes. And he just goes, bah! and I just went click. Like it just, one frame, one shot. We had perfect timing, right? I just go 
click and the water is going out. And I didn't think anything of it. And I looked at the thing, you know, I had processed a film or had it processed in its color. And it came out and it was like, there was everything in the photograph that him and I love, right? The shadow of his knee. Mm, yeah. That he's going for it, that the tide is going out now. Wow. And the face above him, looking down at him with the sun behind it. Whoa. And then if you look at his right hand, that hold is shaped like a heart. Dude. And it just all... <laughs> That's amazing. I didn't notice together. any of that stuff. Wow. Yeah. It all came together in one moment. And it was just a sort of a timing thing and an everything. And so that's why I like to see the whole frame, the whole photograph, the whole story, the whole thing behind that was like, that was it. And that any, was the moment. Any slight sliver of change of angle or anything would have yeah. made this not yeah. the way it is. Yeah. And I didn't, I hadn't seen him on those holds, right? He was like almost out of the frame down left, mm. right? So I didn't know, but I just framed it up and then, you know, Nine times out of 10, you're going to miss that action. But I always noticed with Chris, I'd done this a few other times. I made some other photos of him that got published, even though there was other photographers there. Our timing was always perfect. Mm. Always, always, always perfect. I don't know why that was, but it, like I could just feel when he was going to go and when I needed to hit it. And the problem with action photography is like the, that composition is so right Mm -hmm. But it's so easy when someone's doing action for you just to sort of twist and go f forward. You know what I yeah. mean? You, like, you get into that action with you. Yeah. So it was a lot just to keep the frame right where I wanted it. Yeah. And let the action happen. So I just saw the frame. I felt him. I heard him go. And I hit that button right when it happened. So that photograph, more than a lot of them was when I started making that, I was like, Ooh, there's so much to this. And uh, no one really knows how much, what it means. They go, I mean, it was a cover of uh, Des Novell, a magazine. And the reason why it was a cover is because Chris goes, when we were talking with the, the editor, he goes, use this, use this photograph. It means a really lot to us. And the editor's like, well, what does it mean? And we told him the story and he used it as the cover. Beautiful. Right? Yeah, because it, it meant a lot. That moment, he was fully back. The next day he's in Europe killing it i was going back to yosemite we were just like split up he was healed yeah and so that yeah that's that's something that uh all these little moments happen in your life right and sometimes you can express them and sometimes you remember them sometimes you don't um but that one yeah it's stunning it's Thank absolutely you. stunting everything's in focus i mean high at a high f stop yeah, I mean, probably. your son, your son is, you yeah. see it. Yeah, I had a lot of son. I probably, and that film was probably about 400. Okay. ISO, it was a fast film. Just, and I didn't know if I had it or not. And I didn't even see the legs, you know? Mm. But when that happened, I go, oh man. And Chris immediately saw that. He goes, oh my God, look at the legs. Yeah. The knee, you know, and, and all that stuff. So. I can't state it enough. It's and then we perfect. have this friendship. Yeah. And we've had a really long friendship. I made a lot of kind of really nice photos of him over the years and it's just all based on the fact that we were hanging maybe climbing or doing whatever and i happened to be there and he's driven to succeed and stuff like that but he's so laid back right mm. so our personalities fit but almost to the point where a lot of times we're not making the photos but we're just happy not so he actually works better with photographers who are a little bit more focused on you know quantity i think sometimes but whenever we get together it's just fun just you know the camera comes yeah. out yeah i mean he is also just he's a world legend but yep. growing up in santa cruz yep. it's also just so cool to have this superhero you know yeah, share know, the same exactly. climbing gym yeah you know he's the he's the hometown hero yeah it's it's really cool so and he's such a, a good person a cool yeah. person uh -huh. that's the thing about chris is like we just get along he's cool you know yeah i mean i've never met him but just hearing him talk he's just like you feel how caring he is yeah very much His so. His tone of voice yeah. and stuff. Um, he lives in Spain now, right? Yeah, he lives in Spain, Barcelona. He lo he, he does some of that awesome uh, deep water soloing. He still does that and a lot of other things. And he's kind of his own brand. He's got a few gyms over there. Yeah, Charm and, Climbing. Yeah. Have you done any photographs with him of uh, soloing over there, over the water? No, I haven't done that yet. I would like to. Yeah. Yeah, I want to do some stone nude soloing over the water too. Yeah. But yeah. Well, it's incredible. 
Wow. And the other cool thing is that Santa Cruz isn't really known for its like climbing no. so much. Yeah. They're, like we have Castle Rock and it's all kind of just single pitch, easy top rope yeah. type climbing. So we have Chris Sharma who comes out of Santa Cruz, <laughs> which is incredible. But then also this photo is in Santa Cruz yep. as well. I'm assuming at Panther Beach. Panther Beach. And it's just awesome how you're yeah. able to capture that. There's so much movement in this photo, yet everything yeah. is so clear. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It has a, a, a neat sweeping perspective to it and like a really, yeah, iconic kind of feel to it. And it's it, timeless. They just, yeah. Kind of how a, old was he in this? He would have been probably about 17 or 18. Yeah. Team Dean and Chris putting uh, Santa Cruz on the map. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Dean, what's uh, what's next for you? What do you got going on coming up? Um, you know, that's a really good question, actually. And I have a few things that I've been working on, uh, a couple of little things with a filmmaker um, where I'm reading some of my my captions, my prose, and we're running photos over it. Um, you know, I want to make a film. I still have that thing that I want to do. I, I want to make a film about climbing. I want to make it, uh, it's a climbing fairy tale. Yes. And there's all kinds of backstory and stuff to it, but that's kind of one of the things I want to do. Another of the things I want to do is, is like that book with Alexandria. Uh, I want to make a short film to allow us to get an exhibition and then a catalog of the exhibition. And that would be the book. So, you know, there's a few projects that I've kind of completed one part of them and I have to move forward with the other part. And it's a matter of, of me really figuring out what it is I want to do there with the house in, in Yosemite. That's a huge weight off of me and I can, I can hole up there and work. Yosemite Climbing Museum, it's kind of really up in the air right now what I'm going to end up doing with them. It's kind of like you start off doing your own thing and nobody really gives a sh And then, you know, people buy photos here and there and then like 20 or 30 years later, 20 years later, it's like everybody's, oh, this stuff is great, you know, and, and yeah, I guess you did your thing and I go, hey, I was just doing my thing. I, I kind of want to go back to that and, and figure out what it's going to be. You know, you look at photographers, especially, they get to a certain age, they're going to retire or their work just isn't the same. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have the same edge and all that stuff to it. So I look at that in me too. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, it takes a lot of energy to, you, you know, with me, I can't just make one photo. I'm going to have to make a lifetime more, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to make 20, 30, 40. It's going to have to be a big thing. Right. I don't know why but it, it has to be important that way for me. So really what I'm looking forward to doing now is my own thing, but also for the first time in my life, I feel like I have so much experience, right? And so much to offer that whatever it is, it's something that I need to put out there. Yeah. Well, it's so obvious that you have such that, that strong compass that, and, and like you said, it has to be important to you. Right. There's a lot of people that sell out and I love that you are on that, that that road of has to be important to me. I'm right. not going to do what somebody else tells me to do. No, it's not going to work. I don't care if they pay me to do something that I'm totally unhappy with. Right. Now, at this point, I can't. It will take away from anything else I've got to do. Yeah. And I'm not really sure what that is, but it seems like it, it's continuing to create and continuing to use the climbing as my canvas Yeah. and all those people as my paint. So it's it's still there. Finding this place in... The West finally being legitimate, it will, it will show up. <laughs> yeah. Well, Dean, it's been a pleasure, like I said, again, for you coming on. Amazing photographer, amazing guy. You know, I consider you a friend now. And oh, for sure. It's just so cool to hear There's plenty this. of room for the van. We have a big pad, you know, just pull it up there. Hey, yeah, I love it. Just tell them awesome. you're going to see me at Hans Flooring's house. Yeah. <laughs> Dude. You, all you people out there, you're seeing Dean Fidelman at Hans Flooring's house in Yosemite West. Just say that at the gate. Get your ass <laughs> in the valley. You can come over if you want to. Bring food and dope. <laughs> Wonderful. Dean, <laughs> always a pleasure. Like I said, you're welcome on the VanCast anytime. And, uh, Definitely. And we'll just hang out, too. Cool. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, cool. Talk to you soon. Yep. I feel like I'm at the